Namaste. So in this video, I want to talk about some very confidential, subjective experiences on the path. And these, of course, are linked to Shankaracharya's system of four views, the Chatra Darshanam. Here's a figure of it. In case you're not familiar with our videos, this is our core ontology. This is the background and the framework against which we measure and evaluate consciousness. So consciousness, of course, is dualistic because it's composed of subject and object. And the quality of consciousness also is very important. And basically there are three kinds of consciousness. Waking consciousness or jagra, dreaming consciousness or svapna, and deep sleep consciousness, shushumti. So the quality of the states of consciousness also differs according to the view. And especially the consciousness of God. I want to narrow down the focus and talk about the subjective experience of the consciousness of God in these four views. This is something that's not discussed very much in the scriptures. This comes from my own personal experience. And of course, your experience may be very different, but I'm going to try to make it as general as possible so that it applies to as many people as I can. This video is very hard to make, by the way. <laughs> this is a really difficult subject. So pardon me if I don't mention your particular point of view or state of consciousness or whatever. It's quite possible. But don't take it personally. Anyway, in the beginning, everybody pretty much is in Dvaita Vada. And that means one has faith in God. That I, the self with a small s, the empirical self and God are different. Now I'm here on earth and God is off somewhere. But I have a relationship with God. And that relationship is expressed in acts of piety, acts of goodness, acts of moral purity. So worship of the deity in any form, chanting of the names, offering prayers, doing ceremonial observances, following moral rules, austerities, penances, charity, uh, temple worship, family life according to scriptural rules and regulations. All this is part of the Dvaita Vada. All this is part of Karma Yoga. So we're not even going to talk about the Pashu. We're not even going to talk about the, the animals walking on two feet who are Viyogi, who have no relationship, no connection with God. As they'd fall outside of our gamut. So the lowest level then is organized sectarian religion according to scriptural rules and regulations. And this stage is the majority of human consciousness. At the moment, there are so many different religions even within so-called Hinduism, whatever that is. <laughs> there are many, many different orientations, many deities, many forms of worship, many types of yoga and so on. But they are all within duality, 
the view of duality that I and God are different. So this view starts out with God being very far away. But as one accumulates pious credits, as one develops more and more spontaneous feelings toward God, something strange happens. God starts to come closer. And it feels subjectively like God is popping up here and there. In the beginning, it's a rare thing. Maybe in a very ecstatic kirtan or in a very beautiful hymn or a very stunning view of nature's beauty or something like that, one will have that feeling, oh, the presence of God. And this presence becomes more and more frequent, intense, and personalized. One begins to see God in a particular form. One begins to feel towards God a particular relationship. And this relationship can be one of five principal flavors. That is neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. So conjugal means erotic, uh, means sexual. Let's not beat around the bush here. It's sexual, it's erotic, it's romantic. It's all of these things. Uh, but what it's not is mundane. <laughs> it's not mundane at all. It's something between you and God on a very subtle level. There can be mixtures of these flavors too. But anyway, as one reaches toward the upper end of the Dwaita Vada, these feelings of the presence of God start to become more and more frequent, intense, and the loving emotions start to become more and more clarified. Until at some point, one realizes God is here within me. That changes everything. God is no longer far away. God is no longer somewhere else or someone else. But God is an intimate part of your own self. Has to be. Otherwise, how can you feel this strong and more and more frequent until it becomes a steady thing? Huh? This presence of God, this ecstatic, powerful presence. So God must be part of me. God must be in me. God is here. Uh -huh. And then at a certain point, one starts to feel God is mine. To get to this point, one have, has to already surrender. I am God's. I belong to God. He can do whatever he wants with me. But at this point, the feeling is reversed that God is mine. In whatever form you worship, in whatever mood you worship, and whatever kind of pastime or activities that you have together in your inner life. So this is where the direction of worship toward God shifts from something external to internal. God isn't out there anymore. I mean, God still is out there, but mainly God is in here with me. This marks the turning point between Dvaita Vada, or duality, and Vishishta Dvaita Vada, or conditional non-duality. In other words, one still feels a difference between myself, the empirical self, and God. But yet, there is a kind of oneness also. So this begins the actual bhakti yoga. And if, let me give you a personal hint. <laughs> At this stage, if you're not breaking the rules, 
the religious rules of how you're supposed to behave with God. It's not the real thing. <laughs> real spontaneous love is always above and beyond the rules and regulations of the scriptures. Always. In fact, for, to give one small example, the relationship between Krishna and the gopis is called lawless love. Lawless love. There are no laws, no rules to it. It's simply love. It's not any kind of quid pro quo business relationship or anything like that. Huh? It's simply love because we need to love. Both sides. Both ourselves and God. So at this time, generally what happens in the, toward the end or the upper end of bhakti, that God reveals a particular form that you have been worshiping without even knowing it and approaches you and initiates you into a higher view a view where you finally see the possibility of becoming one with God. And I don't mean bland kind of oneness. I mean a, a oneness where you both retain your individuality. Huh? This is called a chintya bhed abhed. It means inconceivable oneness and difference at the same time. So this simultaneous oneness and difference, this is the highest level of bhakti. And at this level, you begin to feel something called ananya bhakti, that I am not different from God. God is myself. This little self, this empirical self, self with a small s, this is only a temporary version of myself. And God is my real self, the part that never goes away. And consciousness, you will see, never goes away. Consciousness is always there with you. This marks the turning point between the Vishishta Dvaita Vada and the Vivarta Vada. The Vivarta Vada, the distinguishing characteristic of which is that you see the world as an appearance only, as an illusion, as a mirage. And within that mirage, you still have a small self, an empirical self, and a body and all that. But now you identify more with God than with that body. You identify more with the inner world, the inner life, than the outer. So this begins the process of meditation. In authentic Vivartivada, meditation is not a discipline. Meditation arises spontaneously on the instigation of God within you. As we said before, God will show or reveal a certain aspect or personality or state of being transcendentally. And this, this is shattering. This completely turns your reality around. And instead of God or heaven being something far off, now the world starts to appear as something far off and imaginary. So then meditation arises all on its own because one has to get to the bottom of this. One has to begin to see things from God's point of view. And of course, the most powerful meditation techniques are meditation on the void and meditation on one's own consciousness. And by this process of meditation, when one gets near the end of the Vivartavada, one sees that God and I are one. There's really no difference. And that this consciousness is simply an appearance. Even though I'm still conscious, I'm still aware of my body and the world around me, 
I don't take it very seriously because the inner reality is so much more real, so much more vivid and powerful in my experience. And I see very clearly that in the empirical self, in the small self, the temporary self, that this great consciousness, this universal consciousness that is God, is simply covered over with upadis, means limiting adjuncts. And we went over that recently in the uh, series on tattvas. So at this point, when one sees that I and God are one, this marks the transition from the Vivartavada to the Ajatavada. Now, this is not something that you can fake. This is not simply an intellectual posture. This is not simply a catchphrase. Oh man, it's all one groovy dude, you know? This is not a fashion. This is not a social ornament to the ego. This is not simply a light thing that you, oh, you go to the workshop and the guru or whoever it is says, yeah, everything's one, man. So yeah, no, I'm one, okay. No, no. Because without going through all those other levels of experience, the experience of oneness is meaningless. It's trivial. It has no value at all. Underneath your pretentiousness of neo Advaita philosophy, you still think you're the body, you still think you have a mind, you still think that you have a social identity, you still care about what other people think about you, and so on. Isn't it? So, setting that nonsense aside, the authentic viv Vivarta to a jatta transition is when one not just thinks about or not just claims to be, but actually experiences this oneness. And how is this experienced? Here's the kicker. You transcend consciousness. You transcend what I call the tyranny of consciousness. In the lower stages, consciousness won't let you go. It's with you all the time, bothering you about so much stuff. And all of that stuff is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Because consciousness, by definition, is dualistic. So everything that you're conscious of is not yourself. So consciousness is a botheration. Consciousness is, is a, a tyranny because it's, it's stuck on. Huh? You can't switch it off until you master the meditation on the void. In that meditation, you're in a space of nothingness, emptiness. And in that space, there is nothing to be conscious of. There's no object, there's only subject. Therefore, it becomes difficult after a while to determine whether you're conscious or not. And at some point, you are able to let go of consciousness completely. That is true enlightenment. That is the highest state. There is no state beyond that. That is Brahman. You are aware that you are. You are aware that you are aware. But there is nothing other than yourself to be aware of. So there is no object, there is only the subject. And that subject is the unlimited Brahman. And that is the end of the tyranny of consciousness. Aum Tat Sat.
ஆம் சாக்தி ஆம்